Hello. Hope everybody's doing well. Jimmy here in Chicago. I want to share with you some of the major mob trials that I went to. Going back to the early 1990s through the mid-2000s, I was very fortunate to sit in and attend some of Chicago Outfit's biggest trials. I've also attended other major federal cases as well. For example, I went to the legendary Family Secrets trial. That was about 14 unsolved murders dating back to the 1970s. And two of the murders were the infamous Bellatro brothers. I went to a major racketeering extortion gambling case with the Sam Carlisi crew. I went to Bobby Salerno's trial. His son, Alex Salerno, represented him. They accused Bobby of being part of a hit team along with Rocky and Felice and others that killed one of the largest bookies in the country. I attended the Mike Large Guy Sarno trial. That was one of my favorites because it showed the outfit's relationship with the outlaw motorcycle gang. I even went to the Larry Hoover trial. Hoover at the time was locked up in Vienna prison running one of the largest gangs in the country from his prison cell. $100 million a year drug operation, 30,000 street soldiers. And when Hoover's lieutenants would come visit him in prison, the government put an ultra-thin transmitter in the visitor's pass. It picked up thousands of hours of conversation of these guys talking in code. You see, anybody can go to a trial. They're open to the public. You go down to the courtroom, you show your ID, you walk in through the metal detector, and you find out what's on the docket. And sometimes there are several trials all going on at the same time. But when you walk into that courtroom for the first time, you see the judge, how they have complete control of the courtroom. You've got the prosecutors polished, educated, very well prepared. They very seldom lose a case. They've got a 98% conviction rate. I have coffee with some of the old timers in Grand Avenue and they tease me. They say, when you walk into the Dirksen Federal Building in that lobby, your rights go right out the fucking window. Our prosecutors here in Illinois at the Dirksen Federal are some of the best in the business. Literally the cream of the crop, unlike uh, prosecutors in New York, L.A., where their cases uh, seem to fall apart. Now, on the opposite end, you'll see some of the best, some of the worst defense attorneys in Chicago. And these mob attorneys are real characters. A lot of personality, a lot of bullshit, a lot of smoke and mirrors. But what I like about the uh, defense lawyers is they're sociable, unlike most prosecutors. You could actually make small talk with them during breaks in the courtroom. And years ago, some of the defense attorneys would actually ask the court buffs what our thoughts, what our opinions were of the trials. You know, you got guys like Joe the Shark Lopez, Damian Cheros, Daryl Goldberg, Tom Breen, Mike Martin. Then you got the older gentlemen like the late Ed Jensen, Rick Helprin, Terrence Giuseppe. A lot of these guys like to have the drink, too, because some of them are under immense pressure during these cases. So they like to have a drink, you know, to take the edge off. I've seen several of the top defense lawyers out and about whining and dining at some of the bars and restaurants that I go to. Now, we're going to go back to 1992. That was the very first trial that I ever went to. I will never forget it. When I first walked in that courtroom, I had no idea who was who. There were two, three tables, maybe 10, 15 men all sitting around in suits. It took me a good hour, hour and a half to figure out who all the players were and what the hell was going on. One of the main defendants at this trial was Gus Alex. He was 76 years old at the time. And him and his co-defendants, Lenny Patrick, who was 78 years old at the time, 
Mario Renone, James Lavelli, and Nick Geo. These guys were charged with a seven count indictment on running a very violent extortion crew. They were going into car dealerships, restaurant owners, and small businesses demanding hundreds of thousands of dollars and threatening extreme violence. Now, the government alleged that not only did Gus Alex approve the violent extortions, but that he also received kickbacks from his low-life career criminal murderer friend, Lenny Patrick. Now, Gus Alex, he goes back to the Al Capone days. This gentleman rose to the ranks of the Chicago outfit and became a top boss right under Tony Accardo and Paul Rica. In fact, when Joey Ayupa went away in the straw man case, it was Gus Alex and Sam Carlisi that took over the day-to-day -day operations of the Chicago outfit. Gussie was so well trusted by Tony Arcardo and the outfit brass that he controlled all the Chicago outfit's money in their Swiss bank accounts. Gussie would fly three, four times a year with his supermodel girlfriend to Switzerland where he would oversee the mob's money. Gus Alex was also very well connected. He controlled pretty much the entire Chicago Police Department from the beat cop all the way up to the sergeant, the commander, in every precinct, in every district. He had major influence on most of your Cook County judges, your state officials, your union officials. He had a stranglehold on the first ward along with his good friends Pat Marcy and Alderman Fred Rohde and the 50 aldermen. He had a lot of friends that were senators, congressmen, friends in Hollywood, a lot of socialites. He was even close with Vice President Spiro Agnew. That was President Nixon's vice president. So Gus Alex had a connections from cops all the way up to the White House. Now, Gus Alex made literally millions of dollars through the rackets over the years. He was very well respected. And unlike a lot of Tony Arcardo's men, he listened to Tony Arcardo by keeping a very low profile. Even though he lived the high life, he kept a low profile, kind of like Carlo Gambino. Gus Alex very seldom got indicted, and the feds were desperate to, to arrest him and indict him on something. So fast forward, they finally indicted him on a bullshit extortion case when he was 76 years old. Now here's Gus Alex walking into the Dirksen Federal Building right there in the lobby back in early 1992. You can see he's aged, definitely had some health issues. He was frail. He walked with a cane. But you could tell by the look on his face He's not too happy, very nervous, very scared. And I met Gus Alex's nephew, who sat next to him every day in court. And he told me that Gus Alex made millions of dollars. He had connections all over the world. He could have easily went on the land. They would have never have found him. But Gus Alex underestimated the two young prosecutors, Chris Gear and Ron Safer. This was their first big trial. He also underestimated the government's case against him. And his biggest mistake, Gus Alex thought that no juror would ever believe a low-life scumbag admitted liar, career criminal admitted killer like Lenny Patrick. He didn't think any juror would find him credible. Now, Gus Alex... He hired two of the top defense attorneys at the time, the best in the business, Carl Walsh. You see the gentleman right next to Gus Alex there, Carl Walsh Sr. 
and Sam Adams. These guys were known as mob attorneys and some of the best defense attorneys money could buy. Now, here's a photo of Carl Walsh, his attorney. That's his son walking Gus Alex to, into court. And one thing I didn't like, for some reason, the defense thought it would be a good idea to have Gus Alex's lawyer's son, Carl Walsh Jr., and another lady who was a little rough around the edges, kind of disheveled looking. They walked Gus Alex into court and out of court every day. They held him by his arms, and he took baby steps. In my opinion, it didn't look very good. They really embellished and overplayed the fact that Gus Alex was uh, up there in age, that he had bad health. But I don't know. I just didn't like the way it looked. Uh, Gus Alex was perfectly capable of walking with his cane. But again, they had the uh, lawyer's son and maybe his girlfriend escort Gus to and from the courtroom every day, putting on a big show in front of the jury. I'm not sure what the jurors thought of it, but I didn't think it looked very good. Now, here's a photo of uh, top counsel, top defense attorney, Carl Walsh. You could see he was trusted by Tony Accardo. They're uh, representing Accardo during uh, one of those Kiefer Senate hearings. But Gus Alex, like a lot of defendants, if they lose the case and are found guilty, they, nine out of ten times, they blame the lawyers. In this case, I know for sure Gus Alex was not happy with all the money that he spent on Carl Walsh, Sam Adams. He felt they were overrated, and they definitely got outdueled by a young prosecution team of Chris Gere and Ron Safer. Now here... Now, here's Cole Counsel, Sam Adams Jr., big-time mob attorney for Chicago back in the day. This guy's quite a character. I've seen him several times at the Dirksen Federal Building. And he was the one that cross-examined Lenny Patrick on the stand. In my opinion, he went too soft on him. He should have really have torn into Lenny Patrick. Uh, I thought he could have done a, better, done a much better job. Now, his son, Sam Adams Jr., is a top defense attorney today. I've seen him in court representing uh, Rod Blagojevich, Governor Blago. And during Blago's first trial, this lawyer done such a good job creating reasonable doubt that one uh, black female hung. So it was a hung jury, but obviously... The feds charge Blago again, and anytime the federal government charges you a second time, there's no way in hell you're going to beat the government twice. But here's a an awesome father and son defense team. Um, now here's Gus Alex. The prosecution and judge admitted that in order to get a high-ranking member of the Chicago outfit like Gus Alex, who's pretty much untouchable, they literally made a deal with the devil. This low life here who testified he knew Gus Alex for 35 years goes back to the Al Capone gang. He was Sam Giancana's number two man as far as um, hits and bombings that Giancana ordered. When the lawyer asked him, how many people did he shoot? How many people... Did he bomb for Jim Ciancana? He laughed and said he couldn't remember. It was such a high number, this low life couldn't remember. He told the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that he paid Gus Alex $1,000 every month for the extortion. He was the leader of the violent extortion crew. He controlled uh, gambling on the North Shore, Rogers Park, Evanston, and all the North Suburbs. He's pretty much a Jewish gangster. This gentleman was in and out of jail his, most of his life. He actually knew Jack uh, Jack Ruby and at one point was a suspect in the JFK assassination. I've never seen a bigger low life in my life. This guy was real nasty on the stand, making wisecracks, making jokes, um, 
how the jury, any jury found him credible, I'll never know. But a low life like this, he had so much detail knowing the defendant, Gus Alex, for 35 years. And the government does such a good job of cooperating everything that, yes, jurors actually find these guys credible. But if I was on that juror, I would have 100% found him not credible, and I would have found Gus Alex not guilty, or the worst, it would have been a um, hung jury. Money Patrick admitted that he killed at least six people. He had knowledge of over 22 other murders, never had a regular job in his entire life, and admitted he was scared of dying in prison. That was his main motivation to wear a, wear a wire on Gus Alex and testify against the other defendants. I've never seen a, a worse human being than this, and I've seen a lot of low-life witnesses. Uh, Nick Calabrese testified to participating in 14 murders. In one of the victims, John Mendel, he literally slit his neck from ear to ear. I seen B.J. Jehoda, a career criminal, testify against Rocky and Felice and his crew. I seen a corrupt lawyer, Bob Cooley, testify against Harry Alleman. I seen other killers and gangbangers and rapists as witnesses. This is who the government uses to catch the big fish but I've never seen anybody as nasty or as ignorant as this guy here, Lenny Patrick. I hope to God that he's burning in hell and he pays for all the crimes that he committed. Now the main enforcer, Chicago outfit made guy Mario Renone, he reported directly to Lenny Patrick and I'll never forget seeing a young Mario Renone in the courtroom sitting next to Nick Gio and Gus Alex. This guy looked like a professional wrestler, very uh, built and very intimidating. And then many years later, fast forward mid-2000s, after the Family Secrets trial, he got when he got released for the uh, extortion case with Gus Alex several years later, he got pinched with a gun. And as you know, any convicted uh, felon cannot be near a gun. The gun was in a dresser near the nightstand at one of his girlfriend's house. Joe Lopez represented him at the gun case. But it blew my mind to see how bad Mario looked and how badly he aged by being locked up so many years. Many years ago, he thought about possibly cooperating because he thought some of the outfit guys were going to kill him, but he changed his mind. He kept his mouth shut. He did his prison time like a man, and he never rolled. A couple of the car salesmen and restaurant owners testified that he was one of the men that approached them, asking him anywhere from up to $400,000 or he would threaten extreme violence. He told one car dealership manager that if he didn't come up with the money, that Mario would plant him, his wife, and children in the garden in front of the car dealerships. But this was a very serious guy, a heavyweight for the Chicago outfit. Now here's another top enforcer, collector, associate Chicago outfit, James Lavelli. He was one of the defendants and part of the extortion crew. He reported directly to Mario Renone. This guy was very intimidating in the courtroom. He got he was afraid of dying in prison, so he decided that he was going to testify against his good friends and snitch on them. Guys like Nick Gio, Mario Renone, Lenny Patrick. He basically gave the government an A to Z directory end of who's who of the outfit. He part talked about participating in several beatings, several fire bombings. Uh, not a nice guy. Showed no remorse at all. Um, definitely a, a guy you don't want showing up at your business. Several of the victims of the extortion ring testified that when he showed up, they almost literally pissed and shit in their pants just by his presence. 
And the youngest defendant, he was probably in his early 20s at the time, was Nick Geo. This guy looked like an NFL linebacker, Chicago Alpha associate, somewhat of a mob guy wannabe. Uh, he was part of the uh, extortion crew, reported directly to James Lavelli, and they got him for uh, uh, using a few uh, hand grenades where they uh, firebombed the Lake Theater in Oak Park, downtown Oak Park. That's a theater that most of us have been to. A lot of memories there as a kid. Uh, Nick Geo, though, it was amazing to see how he interacted with Gus Alex. He would pour him water, help him up, whisper to him, basically kind of like uh, it's kind of like a father and son relationship, even though he really didn't know Gus Alex. And at one point in the trial, Nick Geo got up and actually asked the judge that if they could be housed together on the same floor so he could kind of look after Gussie, show him the ultimate respect. The judge basically shunned him and said to sit down <laughs> and let his lawyer do the talking. But Nick Geo is an interesting character because he was already in custody. Prior to the uh, Gus Alex trial, Nick Geo tried to escort this guy, John Castellano, someone of a popular hairdresser. He had two pretty successful salons. Nick Geo tried to extort him. The guy actually spit in Nick's face. Infuriating Nick Geo, he pulled out a gun, shot the guy in the face, shot him a couple times, and killed him. Problem for Nick Geo, though, is there was two witnesses that were able to easily identify him. He got convicted for that murder. But what Nick Geo did not know at the time was that hairdresser was good friends with this guy, Johnny Apes. When Angela Lapetria, boss of the 26th Street crew, went to prison, Johnny Apes took over. And Johnny Apes was good friends with the hairdresser. So Johnny Apes and other outfit bosses were pissed off that Nick Geo killed that guy without their permission. Johnny Apes has also had major beef with Ronnie Jarrett, an associate of the 26th Street crew, good friends with the Calabrese brothers. He was talked about quite a bit at the family secrets trial. Ronnie Jarrett would not come when he was whistled in. Eventually, Johnny Apes had enough of Ronnie Jarrett's bullshit. So he gave the green light to the other Calabrese, Tony Calabrese, no relationship to Frank or Nick. And Tony Calabrese shot and killed Ronnie Jarrett right across the street from his house in Bridgeport on Low Street when Ronnie Jarrett was going to a friend's house. And according to Nick Calabrese, Johnny Apes was one of the men that did the lookout when they killed John Thakarada. Now back to Nick Geo. One thing that I just learned not too long ago from one of my viewers. Now getting back to Nick Geo. After he got convicted for murdering that hairdresser, he actually reached out to the FBI three times because he was going to cooperate. He was 20-something years old, definitely didn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison, so he thought about cooperating. The FBI agent testified that on three different occasions, he sat down with Nick Geo. However, the FBI agent never recorded these interviews never took any notes, so there's no proof that these meetings actually happened. Nick Geo was obviously scared by killing the by killing the hairdresser, and he thought maybe that Johnny Apes and the outfit were going to kill him. But in the end, like a man's man, he did not roll. He did not cooperate. He kept his mouth shut, did his time, and he's still in prison today for that murder. Hopefully, he'll get a chance to see the light of day. But that's Nick Geo. One thing I loved about the Gus Alex trial is that the prosecution actually had doctors from Northwestern Memorial Hospital testify 
that they were the conduit, that they would send messages and receive messages between Gus Alex, their patient, and Lenny Patrick. Because obviously two convicted felons, two mob guys like Lenny Patrick and Gus Alex can never be seen associating together. So they would actually use the doctors to send messages. And at one point, one of the doctors even took a, a brown paper bag of cash with 10000 in it and handed it over to Gus Alex. So these guys were so slick, they actually used doctors at Northwestern Hospital to be the go-between. Now, just a few days before Lenny Patrick testified, little Jimmy had somebody in the outfit put a bomb on the porch of Lenny Patrick's daughter. It blew up. They were trying to scare Lenny Patrick to keep him from testifying against such a heavyweight like us, Alex. But what little Jimmy in the outfit did not realize that this low life here, Lenny Patrick, was such a nasty human being. He had not talked to his daughter in over 22 years. He had absolutely no relationship with his daughter or any of his family member. And when they asked him about that on the stand, he laughed about it and said, it's no problem. He can care less about his daughter or any one of his family. Now here's Sam Carlisi. This guy was the underboss of Joey Upa and boss of Chicago outfit at one time. Him and Gus Alex shared responsibilities when Iupa went to the can. But I bring him up because Lenny Patrick and James Lavelli, two of the government's star witnesses who did not want to die in jail, they flipped and testified against Sam Carlisi and his entire crew, little Jimmy Marcello, Tony Zizzo, Anthony the Hatch, and the Bonavolante brothers. So James Lavelli, a career criminal, and Lenny Patrick, a Jewish gangster, going back to the Al Capone days, couldn't handle spending any time in jail. They decided to flip, cooperate against Sam Carlisi and Lenny and Gus Allen. Now here's a photo they showed at both trials. They showed us at the Sam Carlisi trial, and they also showed it at the Gus Alex trial. They were showing that Gus Alex, the guy to the left, was actually meeting with Sam Carlisi, two outfit bosses that obviously knew each other because the defense claimed that Sam Carlisi never met Gus Alex and that Gus Alex never met Sam Carlisi. But this picture tells a different story. And during these family secrets trial, they show all these surveillance photos that the FBI gets without any of these mob guys ever knowing it. Now, if there was an MVP of this trial, it would definitely go to this guy, Ron Safer. Him, along with Chris Gear, were the two young prosecutors that took on the huge task of convicting a, a major, major player like Gus Alex. They were very well prepared and they knew and they admitted after the trial that they literally made a deal with the devil in order to get finally get Gus Alex. Uh, but Ron Safer not only put away Gus Alex, but several other high-ranking uh, outfit and, and corrupt federal officials. And now Ron Safer is a top defense attorney. And that's common where you, you got guys that start out as prosecutors putting away all the bad guys making anywhere from eighty to 120000 a year. Then when they get a little experience under their belt, they switch and become top defense attorneys that make hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. But this is Ron Safer. I've seen him many times um, at the Dirksen Federal Building. Most of the time I see him as a prosecutor, uh, but he's one of the best defense attorneys as well. Now here's a federal judge. James Elisa, he presided over the family secrets. I'm sorry, he presided over the Gus Alex trial. And like most federal judges, they're definitely pro prosecution. When these guys retire, I think they have a uh, retirement 
a pension of $120,000 a year. Not, not a bad gig, but definitely pro prosecution. And there was a lot of evidence that he could have allowed in about Lenny Patrick. The fact that he was a suspect in the JFK assassination. He killed more people than he led on to. He lied on the stand, committed perjury. But the judge would not allow certain evidence in. So the jury didn't get to hear everything. I'm confident if the jury heard everything we all knew about Lenny Patrick, they definitely would have found him not guilty. That's how nasty um, Lenny Patrick was. But what pissed me off the most about this judge is that Gus Alex at 76 years old, he basically gave him a life in prison sentence where Gus, he ended up dying of a heart attack in his late 80s. Gus, he did like, I think he gave him like 15 years but this judge only gave Lenny Patrick less than four years in prison and like an $80,000 fine. Four years in jail for a guy that admitted six murders, had knowledge of over 20, robbed over 100 banks, and shot and firebombed hundreds of people. What a deal. That's what our government does. They cut deals with devils to go after some of the bigger fish. And in the end, just like all federal trials, the evidence is overwhelming. Usually it's a slam dunk. All the defendants were found guilty. Gus Alex, at 76 years old, was basically given a death sentence. 15 years in prison. He died in his late 80s in Kentucky of a heart attack. Meyer Renone served about 15 years, got out, got pinched again on a gun charge, and is out today, free man. Hopefully Mario is behaving himself. James Lavelli was sentenced to four years for all the extortion, firebombing, beatings, and crimes he committed. He only got four years, a career criminal. Nick Geo is in prison for murdering the hairdresser. Never cooperated, never rolled. He'll probably never see the light of day again. And again, Lenny Patrick, career criminal, one of the worst of the worst, right up there with Satan and O.J. Simpson and Osama bin Laden. He gets four years in prison for six murders. If you guys like my Gus Alex trial story, please hit the like button. Subscribe, share with your friends. The next trial we're going to talk about, you're going to get an insight from the courtroom. We're going to talk about Sam Carlisi, the Sam Carlisi crew. That was little Jimmy Marcello, Tony Zizzo, Anthony the Hatch, a couple of the Bonalante guys, and a few others. That was a major gambling extortion Rico case. My YouTube channel is mostly about what I hear from being inside the courtroom. It's not any book, magazine, or anything I read online or any movie or documentary I watched. These are stories from inside the courtroom. I hope you could appreciate it and stay tuned for more.